Okay, I think we'll start. Welcome to this seminar, uh, NUPI seminar on uh, migration and EU's role. Uh, well, there is now um, two years since Europe were confronted uh, with a large number of migrants crossing the borders, uh, and we were talking about the migration crisis. Things have calmed down a little bit. It is no, at least it is no longer headline news. But it is, of course, still a challenge uh, that might be dramatic, especially for the refugees themselves, but also for the countries they leave from and the countries they come to. Today, we will focus on European responses and how they are viewed from the South. Um, lacking the strength to overcome the political obstacle in imposition of internal burden sharing since late 2015, the EU has relied increasingly on external responses to the crisis of its migration and asylum regime. The two pillars of this external strategy are the March 2016 deal with Turkey and the Africa-centered new partnership framework launched a few mo months later. Today we ask, what is really new in these policy frameworks? How are they being implemented? How big, big is the risk that they backfire, both politically and operationally? And which concrete alternatives can be envisaged? We are very pleased to have, uh, to pleased that uh, Dr. Virtue Pastore could come back to NUPI to give us his views on these issues. Pastore was here in 2015 when the migration crisis was at its peak, and now we are eager to hear how you view the situ situation today. And Pastore is very well placed to talk about these issues uh, because he is a, the director of the International and European Forum for Migration Research in Torino. He has previously been deputy director of the International Relations Think Tank Center for International Policy Studies in Rome, and also a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Florence. And beside research, he is, has also worked as an advisor on migration policy issues for both national in Italian um, and various international institutions. And after his presentation, uh, Morten Boos, who is a research professor at NUPI, will give a presentation that focuses on how these policies are viewed from the South. Morten works uh, predominantly on issues concerning peace and conflict in Africa and is the project leader of the EU-funded project EU ANPAC, which focuses on EU crisis response. Uh, and the title of his presentation will be Imagining Another Life Trajectory, a Push and Pull Effects in the Pathway to Europe. And this seminar is um, part of our seminar series on Europe, and it, uh, it is also closely linked to the EU UNPAC project. And uh, for your information, this seminar will be streamed. So, for you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pernille. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure being back after almost two years um, I was here, I think it was September 2015, uh, right after the outburst of what we call, let me open up this, if I can manage, oops, well, no problem, <laughs> I cannot drive it to the point. Um, when the, yes, please, thank you. <laughs> when the so-called refugee crisis or migration crisis or migration policy crisis uh, was, uh, out, was bursting out. Uh, and I think it's, it's particularly interesting to, to be back now and, and take stock of what has happened in these almost two years. Uh, a lot have, has happened, of course, in the field of, of migration policies at large in the European Union and at, Europe at national level in many uh, uh, European countries. Uh, there were dramatic uh, evolutions. And uh, it's true, the, uh, Pernilla said that the sense of urgency has a little bit waned away. And I'll, I'll be back on this because it's, I think it's an important uh, issue about the, how the, uh, the so-called crisis is perceived from different latitudes and uh, different, uh, in different capitals and in different places. Um, yes, the, uh, I was invited by, by NUPI's colleagues to focus on one particular aspect, which is the so-called external dimension of migration policies, namely the relations with sending and transit countries, as the phrase goes. Now, also on this, we, we will have something to say probably because currently it's very hard to single out a country as a receiving country and full stop, or a sending, just a sending country or just a transit country. So, I mean, the complexity of movements, of migratory movements, particularly 
in and from the African continent has evolved in a way which makes it difficult to, to distinguish clearly between sending and receiving and transit countries in, be in between, but uh, still the, the EU jargon uh, speaks a lot in these terms. Uh, the driving question uh, that, I, that I propose is uh, just old wine in bigger bottles. I mean, is there anything really new in the external dimension, in foreign migration policy, if you want, as it is being conceived at European level, or is it just more of the same, as one could probably uh, say? I will argue that it is something in between, but I'll, I'll hope I'll be, I'll be clear on that later. Uh, just briefly, I, I will structure my presentation in, in four parts. I will first uh, look at how the European Union has responded to the crisis in broad terms and try to show how and why the emphasis has shifted from what I would call internal responses to external responses. Then I'll uh, look more specifically at the two main tools of the external uh, or foreign migration policy of the EU, namely the uh, deal, so-called deal with Turkey, and the new partnership framework, which is a policy framework mainly addressed towards a few, a handful of uh, sub-Saharan countries. I will then uh, move to, uh, to the risks of the European approach as it is unfolding beyond and behind the programmatic declarations, policy documents and so, on the ground. And then uh, I'll, I'll try, if I have time left, uh, to focus briefly on outlooks uh, and on strategic options before us uh, in terms of European governance of issue. Is the, is the you know, uh, emergency really over? And if not, how can we uh, prevent that it bursts out once, once more, as it did a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, so first, on, on the response of the European Union to the crisis. Vanille, I have three quarters of an hour. That's right, 40 minutes. Yeah, good. Um, the, uh, fu what fueled the crisis is that this unexpected inflow of asylum seekers, refugees, well, we, we'll talk maybe about the composition of the flows, which is very different when you look at the Aegean or at the central Mediterranean, uh, was distributed in a very uneven way across Europe, of course. Uh, there were a couple of first entry countries which were affected more uh, prominently, Italy and Greece. Uh, transit routes, and the, imp the impact was particularly worrying in the Balkans in the fall and winter of 2015-16, and then uh, a small number of privileged destination countries which were reached by uh, asylum seekers and migrants uh, without you know, legitimate asylum, asylum claims, there were both. Uh, in, the, in the north of, of Europe, of course, as, the, as you know, Germany, Sweden mainly, but also uh, to some extent your country and a few others. Um, so this uneven distribution and the incapacity of the European Union collectively to cope with these asymmetries was the real uh, you know, detonator, the real explosive factor uh, behind the crisis. And the first reaction of the European Union's institutions was an attempt at correcting this uneven distribution by redistributing what was immediately perceived as a burden, as something negative, consistently with the systematic framing of migration, including refugee migration, over the previous couple of decades. Hmm? So this attempt at burden sharing was the first so-called so, sort of Pavlovian reaction of the European Union. Okay, we are hit in a disproportionate and asymmetric way. We have to rebalance that. And quite interestingly, that was exactly what had been happening uh, 25 years before at the time of the previous major, I, and I quote, 
refugee crisis, asyl crisis, you know, flicklings crisis uh, that hit also at the time disproportionately Germany uh, in 1992 peak from uh, the Western Balkans, mainly Bosnia. At the time as well, German authorities, right after unification, etc., in a, in a phase of major transformation, reacted first internally by modifying the German constitution and limiting, I'm not going into the details, uh, practical and technical opportunities for asylum, for asylum claims, and it acted internationally by m m making pressure on uh, fellow Europeans to upgrade their asylum systems in order to make them more attractive and trigger a redistribution or a better distribution of asylum flows and trying to affect uh, asylum seekers' preferences as to their favorite destination. So this parallelism between 2000 uh, 15 and 1992 in terms of a political dynamics is interesting and shows I think persistences and continuities in political and policy patterns in this area. Um, in this case the r main uh, policy tool was the adoption of course of the uh, so-called relocation package, the two uh, decisions of September 2015 uh, deciding about the, you know, prospective relocation, redistribution of 160,000 asylum seekers from countries with a high recognition rates. So countries which were, which could be expected, where the claimants could be expected to have a positive decision uh, about their asylum claims, uh, and it was at the time uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, and Eritrea. Those above 75% uh, threshold of uh, recognition of international protection, be it Geneva or subsidiary protection under EU law. The relocation was and is a political failure, as you, as you probably know. Of those uh, 160,000, which is just a tiny fraction of those who arrived in Greece and Italy, and who are still in Greece and Italy to some extent, only a tiny fraction was, uh, was relocated. In the case of Italy, we are now, we are now at about 5,000 relocated persons, and I think some 12 or 15,000 relocated from, from Greece. Obviously due mainly to the lack of cooperation uh, on the side of several EU member states, some in a very blatant and provocative way, I mean, uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, they, they, uh, they um, uh, filed a, 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 a case against the relocation decisions in the European Court uh, of Justice, and they, they politically, they very, you know, uh, strongly opposed the decisions, uh, but also other countries were uh, more uh, discreetly uh, you know, denying uh, cooperation to what is a binding decision. So the failure of this internal response pushed the European Union towards more uh, emphasis towards uh, uh, on on uh, external responses. So if we cannot manage, if we not, if we cannot fix the uh, challenge, the issue internally, we try to prevent the reformation of the issue by preventing by acting externally on the deeper causes of these movements, trying to block the movements or to, you know, affect in the language of the European Commission, the root causes of the movements and prevent uh, future, uh, future events of a kind. So I think that this was really a, a major strategic uh, turn in the attitude of the European Union towards migration challenges uh, turning from the inside to the outside, which would, in principle, call for a transformation of the functioning and of the tools of the European Union, because the European Union as a whole, not only on migration, has been developing itself in a rather introverted way, you know, to, 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 to strengthen itself 
as a common market, as an area of uh, free freedom of movement, and it has traditionally lacked a foreign policy capacity. So in order to be effective in foreign migration policies, which is by all means, I mean, uh, an aspect, a specific strand of foreign policy, you have to have a foreign policy, which is not exactly uh, the case in a full-fledged uh, meaning. Uh, yes, so uh, all this has been taking place in, a, in an environment, in a political environment, and, and media environment, marked by a decreasing emphasis on the issue of mixed flows across the Mediterranean, of migration, etc. Uh, to some extent, that was, of course, uh, you know, caused by the effectiveness of a EU Turkey deal in stemming the flows. It was also, to some extent, uh, uh, the effect of a political you know, decision to try and tone down the debate in the uh, with the French elections approaching, so in the winter of uh, this year, and, and then now also with the German elections uh, getting, getting near. So the, there was a, a strong sense of urgency that, particularly with the French elections and the Dutch election before, there shouldn't be too much you know, fuss about migration because this, of course, could play in the hands of uh, incumbents of uh, populist incumbents exploiting uh, migration cards uh, for, for the electoral gain. Uh, but, uh, of course, if the emergency is over, if the crisis is over, depends quite a lot from your point of view, from where you look at the uh, issue, uh, because uh, if the uh, situation in the Aegean is today not comparable with what, with, with what it was two years ago, uh, in the central Mediterranean and across the so-called central Mediterranean route, that as it is labeled by Frontex, the European Union's uh, border agency, the situation has not changed, or if it has changed, it has changed for the worse. And I'll give you just a few, uh, a few figures. This is the uh, trend of arrivals, and I mean by arrivals, persons either spontaneously getting to European Union's coasts, or persons rescued at sea and brought to the safe, nearer safe harbor port, uh, which is normally, as far as the central Mediterranean route is concerned, an Italian port. As you see, the, uh, the trend has been uh, uneven, has been uh, oscillating, but with a major surge after 2000, well, 2011 was a peak. Then there was a, uh, the, the numbers, the arrivals were subsiding a little bit in 2012 when there was a illusion or a perception or a temporary reality that uh, new Libyan authorities were in charge and therefore the country was more or less controlled by a government, uh, a temporary government. And then with the uh, increase of uh, uh, civil strife again within Libya in 2013 and 14, this produced together, uh, well, the, the Syrian uh, war has a limited impact on arrivals in Italy. Yeah? Uh, only in uh, 2014, there was a significant share of arrivals composed by Syrians, but this lasted only more or less a year because of reasons of visa imposed on Syrians by Egypt on the one hand, and of Syrian migrants realizing that that was too much uh, dangerous, that route was too, too dangerous if you could afford other routes, and it was the case, of course, of, of Turkey. Uh, so you see that the, uh, the, the situation in 2016 has become worse in terms of volumes of flows uh, than, than the year before. Uh, of course, the, yes, I, I, I said this, this was the two driving factors of these, of these peaks. And uh, unfortunately, uh, a similar pattern uh, appears if you look at uh, deaths and, and missing migrants along that, that uh, sea um, channel. Uh, the, uh, 
shape of the curve is, is remarkably similar to the curve of arrivals, but if you look at, uh, at proportions, if you look at the share between persons who, who didn't make it, so persons who were registered, died, dead, or missing along the route, which is always an underestimation of a total, uh, and the total of arrivals, so you, you, you make a sort of um, you know, uh, death, death rate along the route, you see that the uh, victims grows proportionally more than arrivals. If you had almost 19 victims every 1,000 persons who arrived in 2015, the rate grows to over 25 in 2016, which is, uh, you know, the, the numbers are in any case uh, terrifying, but it, the growth is terrifying. And I, I can tell you in a second how this trend can be interpreted. And also the uh, serious, uh, how serious the situation it is along this route where you cannot by any parameter claim that it the crisis is over is shown by other parameters. For instance, in terms of a composition of the flows, you have, well, no, this is 2017 first. Uh, you see that in 2017, the numbers are getting even worse than in 2016. So uh, this is updated at mid-May. Mid you can update it almost daily, unfortunately, by, by now. Well, fortunately, because we lacked timely statistics before, but it is an, a very, you know, of course, painful daily exercise. And at the mid of May, we were at 50, over 50,000 arrivals. We are now at 67, I think, thousand. Uh, and also with uh, uh, deaths and missings, uh, there was a growth compared to the same period uh, last year. Um, I was saying in terms of composition, one of the worrying trends, for instance, is the growing uh, share of uh, minors, of children, and, and amongst uh, the, uh, the persons arriving in, in Italy, uh, because Malta is not a significant uh, place of arrival since years due to some sort of arrangement between Italy and Malta. Italy took the, uh, the, the, the role of uh, safe harbor for all the rescues operated in the central Mediterranean. Uh, and, and this is, of course, particularly worrying, not only in terms of a sheer you know, tragedy of miners having to take this channel, this route, but also in terms of implications for later operations of reception and ultimately integration, because it's well perceived, even though not entirely demonstrated, that the integration challenges with these categories are particularly hard because these are, you shouldn't forget for the great majority, unaccompanied and unattended minors. So you have to, to you know, match the, the, the very poor educational profile with a lack of family support for their integration. Uh, so what, what has been happening? Let me dwell for a second more on, on the situation in the central Mediterranean, which is currently the bulk of a uh, of crisis, of a uh, of, uh, challenge to, to European Union policies. And then I'll get back to the external dimension. Uh, well, first of all, there was a, an important change in the organization and the operational modes of the search and rescue uh, apparatus. Uh, last time I was here, I think we were talking about the uh, engagement of Norway with one ship in the uh, SAR uh, you know, deployment. Uh, I think this is still the case, but the, the uh, search and rescue uh, machinery has, has grown, has changed, and particularly it has changed its modus operandi. They operate closer to the Libyan coast than they used to do in the uh, 2015. Actually, 2015 was when there was a, a shift from uh, an Italian operation called Mare Nostrum to a European smaller operation called Triton. And in that transition, death rates had a surge, 
because the Triton operation uh, uh, operated much closer to the Italian coast than the Mare Nostrum operation uh, used to do, and this produced a, a, a dramatic surge in deaths. So the reaction was to, to push the, uh, what is now the European uh, force called the uh, UNAFORMED, the SOFIA operation, uh, closer and end the Italian forces, which are still the bulk of, uh, of the effort, closer to the uh, Libyan coasts. Uh, it is maybe important to, to give a proportion that, uh, to tell that uh, from 80 uh, to 65 percent of uh, uh, rescue operations are carried out by Italian uh, forces. Uh, the uh, peak in the number, in the share of operations carried out by multinational forces, I think was in 2015 with uh, 30, around 30 percent. And last year, there was a major increase in the role of NGOs. You know that there are several non-governmental humanitarian organizations which uh, started private, mm, of course not profit, uh, rescue operations, and this became important last year uh, with, uh, I think, 35-40% of rescues operated by non-governmental uh, forces. Uh, and this has given also rise recently to a number of controversies that I may say something now. Uh, so what happens? Uh, the, the, rescue operate, the, the rescuers go closer to the Libyan coast and the smugglers reacted very you know, rationally, unfortunately, by reducing investment in the, uh, in the transport operation because they don't need it, because the rescue apparatus is closer. And so they kept, they started using uh, much cheaper uh, embarkations, boats, small, well, small, large inflatable uh, dinghies, mm? uh, notoriously uh, imported from China, very poor quality, very thin rubber, uh, with very little fuel, just fit to get to the area of operation of a search and rescue uh, apparatus. Uh, and this, of course, explains in spite of the uh, reinforcement of, uh, of a rescue uh, deployment, uh, it explains the greater increase in the deaths and, and, and missings uh, along the route. Uh, I said that the role of NGOs uh, in uh, operations has grown, and it should be said, I think, that it has grown and there are you know, a number of big organizations uh, engaged in this, from Save the Children, um, um, Médecins Sans Frontières, plus a number of smaller ones. Uh, and authorities, European and Italian authorities, up to some point were pretty happy that they could you know, enjoy some spontaneous burden sharing in what is a very costly and both economically and politically costly ac activity. But then, in the last few months, it's a matter of the, you know, the last few weeks and months of, of, uh, of uh, media coverage, I don't know how this was reflected and to what extent it was equaled uh, here up in the north, but there was a bitter controversy started by some, I would say, ambiguous charges made by Frontex chief uh, Fabrice Legerie uh, that uh, this non-governmental uh, apparatus was operating in an ambiguous way and was de facto favoring smugglers. Now, this could probably be discussed in objective terms because if you go there and, and rescue, you objectively can have a facilitating effect, but the charge went beyond that, saying that there was a sort of collusion which was absolutely not demonstrated by the ongoing uh, investigations that exist because it's, it's a serious allegation, but nothing of a kind was, was uh, substantiated. So, uh, but this has been definitely an important transformation of what is happening in the on, the, on the sea. Uh, in political terms, now going beyond the technical, even though vital issue of rescue, and patrolling th that 
most difficult and deadly stretch of sea globally. Uh, the real question is, of course, what happens in Libya and what can be done in Libya. Um, there is, that has been over the years since 2011, which was already a very uncoordinated and very um, unconsensual uh, military intervention, you know, to topple the Gaddafi regime. Uh, but also since then, the action of the European Union in, in post-Gaddafi Libya has been very uncoordinated. Uh, very little investment in terms of foreign policy and assistance to the post-Gaddafi uh, Libya in transition. And this, together with the uh, interference of external powers you know, from the, uh, the Gulf and from, uh, and more recently from, uh, from Russia and, and Egypt, has uh, reinforced already powerful uh, internal uh, conflictual internal dynamics. Uh, lack of coordinating EU response, we were speaking with Pernille before about the, for instance, role of uh, France, uh, which has sided quite explicitly with uh, uh, the uh, dominant power in eastern uh, Libya, namely gen so-called maybe, you know, General Haftar, uh, supported by Egypt in uh, clear and, and open contradiction with the dominant uh, position at European level, which was to support the official, even though not in charge for most of the country, government of uh, President al-Sarraj based in Tripoli. So these divisions have has clearly not helped in bringing or helping Libya get to some form of stability. Uh, Italy being invested, you know, being forced by being in the front line uh, has been quite active bilaterally. Uh, the more, most recently, there was a memorandum of understanding between uh, the, the head of government, uh, Gentiloni and, and, and Serraj in February, including focus, a strong focus on migration, whereby, you know, uh, Libyan forces should have uh, reinforced their patrolling, their patrolling in, in their territorial waters, aimed also at uh, controlling uh, outgoing ships and at stopping unauthorized uh, trips, which is of course very problematic in terms of rights of asylum. But this is what is happening, uh, although with little impact on the field, as you can see from the, the numbers. And then a number of other meetings at ministerial level. And I, I'll show you here, this is a very interesting picture because this is a meeting uh, between uh, 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 the European Union's uh, Minister of Interior, which is by, by, by the way delegated to carry out foreign policy, even though foreign migration policy, and the heads of the southern Libyan tribes, the main tribes, the Tebu and the Tuareg, who, you know, um, ascend to the role of international uh, actors, recognized international actors, not out of, uh, you know, uh, some nostalgia for the times of Lawrence of Arabia, but for under the pressure of a sheer, you know, reality that the government in place is not in charge of the southern borders with Niger and Chad and Sudan. And this is where, if not in the Mediterranean, the issue can be somehow tackled. So these, I'm not, I don't have time to go into the details, but these are very, I think, interesting developments in how migration, you know, jumping as a major factor of international relations affects the very nature of international relations, particularly in the relations with Africa, in a way that, or even the Middle East, that in a way that we, we didn't expect in an age of, you know, modern uh, nation states, which is, of course, not what is currently uh, happening in, in, uh, in Libya. And this is Minister of Interior of Italy together with the Ministers of Interior of Chad, Niger, and Libya with the latest of these uh, sort of parallel interior ministries uh, diplomacy which is going on. And which is basically what is left in, the, uh, in a situation of persisting incapacity of the European Union to deal directly with a core issue in Libya. Now, 
coming, and I think I have to speed up a little bit, but uh, coming to the, uh, so I have until 11, that's more or less. Yeah. Uh, uh, the new partnership framework. So let's now look at, at Africa, which has been uh, singled out together with Turkey as the core key priority in terms of the farther layer of the external dimension of European migration policies. Uh, first, a word on the EU-Turkey deal. The deal struck by, you know, under German coordination with a strong role of the Dutch at the time in conceiving the plan and with uh, an unclear role of European Union's authorities because the deal is not an EU agreement mm, and the EU Court of Justice declined you know, competence in judging the legality of the agreement because it's formally not struck by European uh, Union authorities. It's a political convergence uh, based on a joint agreement, but it is not formally a legal deal, at least in the understanding of the uh, European Union. Uh, it was an historical turning point in the history, I would say, of international relations at large and the role migration takes in international relations from both a quantitative and a qualitative point of view. Qu quant from a quantitative point of view, you know, the sum on, on the table is six billion euros over just three years, in theory, then it will depend on the spending capacity, etc. But uh, it's a ma massive sum for this area of policy, of international policy, the you know, precedent which can be compared is the 2008 agreement between Italy and Libya, at the time it was Berlusconi and Gaddafi, which was worth five billion dollars, but over stretched over 20 years, mm, and it had migration at its core. But So the numbers have gone up, and uh, from a qualitative point of view, what is crucial, and from a normative point of view, is that for those of you who are working in the field of asylum policies, the concept of safe third country, namely that you can push back somebody to a country provided this third, which is not the country of origin of, of the asylum seeker, provided this country is safe, uh, the person will not risk his or her life or fundamental, uh, very fundamental rights there, is pushed further uh, in that it is applied to a very controversial case as, uh, as Turkey today. This is the essence from a normative point of view. From uh, another point of view, it should be mentioned, however, that for the first time, this practice of externalizing migration controls, which has been you know, carried out by Europeans, and not only because, of course, also you know, in Central America, the US have been externalizing controls to the south of Mexico to Mexican authorities, although not under such structured policies and agreements, uh, has been extended from the externalization of migration controls of the law enforcement side to at least nominally an externalization of protection, of international protection. Because under the deal, uh, Turkey is not engaged only to keep migrants prospective migrants to the EU within their borders and to stem you know, flows across the Aegean, but also to provide protection to those who are already in the country, uh, in theory, both Syrians and other nationalities. Mm. And the question of implementation is uh, a major question. It's an open question. The EU is lacking monitoring capacity and probably monitoring will under the current political relations with Turkey, uh, and uh, of course a lot on the legitimacy of this agreement depends on how the monitoring is implemented. Uh, another open issue is uh, how credible Turkey's uh, threats to reopen the gates are, and this is a crucial political, uh, political question, because we, have, we are all happy now that the crisis is over, but if Erdogan effectively uh, implemented his repeated threats to reopen the gates in the, in the time of a few weeks, probably, 
I mean, there are empirical uncertainties there, uh, Europe and the Balkans and Greece could find themselves again in the situation of 2015 within, within a short lapse of time. Uh, so the question of, about the stability of the agreement in general is, is very open. Also because it was implemented only for a small part. You know, this mechanism that for every person uh, deported from Greece to Turkey, there should be a resettlement from Turkey to another member state is not implemented, only for tiny numbers. The, quest the part about uh, reactivation of negotiations for the accession of Turkey in exchange of visa liberalization for Turks uh, to, to the European Union has not been implemented. The only part that has been implemented is money in exchange of border controls. And that is the part which is working and which has you know, brought us to this sense of, of uh, relative calm. Uh, what about the new partnership framework? And I move to, to Africa uh, opening uh, the, 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 the path for, for Morten to, to take uh, the floor after me. Uh, the new partnership framework launched in the summer of 2016 has a very strong, very clear focus on Africa. And differently from previous editions of the master plans of European foreign migration policies, and I'm thinking of a global approach on migration and mobility launched originally in 2005, which was, as its name, as its name uh, goes, global. Mm? This is by no means a global strategy. It is targeting very precise uh, countries in uh, the Sahel Strip. So these are the five countries which are the primary ex explicit official priority target of uh, NPF. So it's Senegal, Mali, Niger, uh, Nigeria, and uh, Ethiopia. So these are five countries with which Europe can and wants to have diplomatic relations over migration with a number of you know, tables from migration law enforcement to uh, cooperation aimed at preventing uh, ideally uh, further migration flows. Uh, then you have a uh, in the NPF, in the ne new partnership framework, you, you still have a, a strong focus on two uh, countries which are still priorities associated with the Syrian exodus, so uh, Jordan and Lebanon, but this is a little bit sort of a distinct agenda uh, based on um, separate financial portfolios and on distinct uh, political uh, priorities. And I'm not focusing on that because I understand Morton is, is more directly and myself to some extent interested in the African strand of a strategy. Then you have some unofficial migration priorities which are not written in the NPF lengthy documentation but are in practice uh, very much in the heart of the policy makers because this is, these are the some countries which are crucial for migration dynamics and so you have uh, Sudan South Sudan, uh, Somalia still, and um, yeah, and, and Chad also, uh, which is an important mainly transit uh, country uh, to, to Libya. So these countries are not exactly countries which uh, the European Un Union has such is willing to have uh, formal, established, systematic, wide-ranging diplomatic relations for several reasons, either because they have failed or because they are you know, too authoritarian and too you know, uh, contested in their uh, leadership to have explicit direct relations, but they are definitely important uh, bits of this uh, migration uh, control, migration uh, management puzzle in, in the Sahel. And then, of course, you still have this semi-official uh, super priority, which is Libya, which is the, you know, the, the end of this funnel, which is leading uh, important flows of, of persons under very dire circumstances every year to the shores of the European Union, and which is, yes, it's an official priority because, you know, now the European Union has a representation, uh, 
has direct uh, fl financial flows to Libya, but still very limited. The European Union has allocated 200 million uh, last year uh, for cooperation on migration with, with Libya, which is nothing compared with uh, the six billions on Turkey, even though there is a discourse of replicating the, Lib uh, the Turkish approach on Libya, but the two situations are amazingly different. Uh, I, I'll yes, I, I want to have a, a few words on the risks of this approach, because on paper, the approach of the NPF, like in general, the approach of the uh, European Agenda on Migration, which is the most encompassing policy document of the European Union on migration, is quite comprehensive and balanced. It is dealing with four dimensions of migration policies, namely, uh, I quote from this European Agenda on Migration, which applies also to, Euro to the NPF. On the one hand, first and foremost, reducing incentives for irregular migration, which is a nice way to put it, but it's basically about you know, stemming irregular flows and, and combating uh, smuggling organizations. Then you have the rescue component, which is highly emphasized, although not very effective, unfortunately, so far, saving lives and securing external borders. Then you have, in the words of the agenda, fulfilling Europe's duty to protect, to, so carrying out uh, protection, international protection, not only after the crossing of the borders, but in principle, you know, also with, with an external projection. This is inside the architecture of principles of the European Union, as of other countries, I guess, like yours, which is cooperating on this very importantly with the European Union. And finally, you have a new policy on legal migration. Because there is this implicit, not too implicit, uh, understanding that if you open up the legal channels, you automatically uh, reduce the incentives to go along the illegal channels, which is a very far-fetched uh, hypothesis in terms of the real sociology of migration, dynamics of migration. And we can talk about it. In practice, what is happening in the implementation of the NPF, of the New Partnership Framework, in those, particularly in those five priority countries, and particularly in countries like Niger, like Ethiopia, like Nigeria, the first things done are, for a vast majority, uh, cooperation on border controls and on migration law enforcement. So once again, readmission of deported persons, uh, capacity building of border forces, uh, you know, transfer of technical equipment for monitoring borders, be it uh, in the desert or at sea, and so on. Because this is easily done. I mean, you have the capacity. You have the interlocutors, which are mainly security forces in partner countries, in sending or transit countries. And this is what the electorate is supposed to be craving for. Mm. Uh, but, and I conclude on the next slide, uh, so I, I leave a final part on the outlooks, but I think I, we can come back on that in, in, the, in the discussion. Uh, this uh, unbalanced approach, which is basically falling back in a, an old pattern of unbalanced externalization, focusing on migration controls first, and then development will come, uh, or legal migration channels will come, has, is understandable politically, but has intrinsic risks. And I try to, to briefly uh, highlight some of these potential perverse effects, potential but also actual, because they have been you know, actually demonstrated in specific in instances, as I will try to argue. First potential uh, perverse effect, or unintended effect at least, is that in both cases you have to choose your interlocutor amongst, of course, those who are in charge of security policies in those countries. For instance, in the case of Sudan, there was a big debate because one of the big men in the security forces in Sudan is the former head of uh, Janjaweed uh, guerrilla which was the main responsible for atrocities in the Darfur years ago. And now, 
rightly, as it is being done often, it has been incorporated in the state apparatus in order to, you know, you know, get to some form of coexistence between former enemies. But the problem is that these kind of persons, now, the, the issue is complicated, of course, the European Union and Italy has, have denegated that this is actually the case, but there were serious allegations. I'm not able to say a final word on this particular case, but just to give you a flavor and an example of what can happen. Because that kind of people have to be the necessary interlocutors if you want to you know, get to the objective of having some form of control, for instance, between, at the border between Sudan and Libya. Hmm? But if you reinforce with substantial financial and technical cooperation those components of that kind of regime, of course, you don't make a great service to the overall pluralism and stability of that uh, specific uh, political polity. Hmm? Other examples can be made about Ethiopia, but also about Turkey. Hmm? Uh, it's very hard and, and very controversial. I mean, it cannot be demonstrated that Erdogan would not have taken the same path if he didn't have the same political leverage thanks to the refugee crisis, but it is a you know, credible, a plausible hypothesis that is worth discussing. I mean, it's dutiful to discuss, I think. Second, outsourcing migration repression, particularly on the emigration of fellow nationals of that partner state is intrinsically a politically risky operation. Because if I think that your country, I mean, is sending un unwanted and you know, uh, unwelcome migration flows to my country, and I, I ask you to please stop your people coming, I turn you into a gendarme, into a, you know, guard on your own people on a fundamental liberty, or what is perceived quite globally as a fundamental freedom, even though unrecognized. And this can create issues of undermining internal consensus. There are serious uh, you know, interpretations about the 2011 Arab uprisings, where, whereby the uh, compression on a massive scale of uh, fundamental desire to move of the Arab youth in, in a number of countries, uh, primarily based on the Schengen Code, was one of the factors increasing the political pressure and political dissatisfaction in those regimes and ultimately bringing to the outburst in, in 2011 in, in, in Egypt and in Tunisia, which is, you know, one may discuss whether it, it was a a good or a bad development uh, uh, from a, a broader historical perspective, but there it can be argued that migration controls had a role in generating the political tension that then exploded. Uh, finally, uh, pushing African countries in, the, in this particular case to introduce border controls uh, can, uh, can, I think, have a role in, from an economic point of view, in hampering economic integration at, at regional level in the regions of origin. You know that Western Africa is the region in the world which, according to polls, has the highest propensity to emigrate. It is uh, also uh, one of a few regions that has uh, an internal freedom of, of movement and trade agreement, which is the ECOWAS. If you think that mobility, internal, intra-regional, and international, is a problem, and you push these countries to reinforce internal migration controls in the region, you may have a counter, uh, an unintended and ultimately negative effect in terms of growth, of regional growth, because you hamper a dynamic which is ongoing already quite difficult in terms of regional integration. Uh, and here, I mean, the, the, the fundamental dilemma of which are the relations, the very complex relations between human mobility and economic development come under uh, scrutiny. And I'm not going into this uh, crucial uh, 
conceptual and political issue, which is, in any case, at the end of uh, our, which needs to be at the bottom of our strategic reflection on what to do in Africa from this point of view. And finally, a more specific effect of uh, unbalanced externalization, if you increase controls along the established routes, of course, there will be an, adap an adaptive behavior on the side of migrants and smugglers that will try to circumvent the new obstacles and find new ways or new routes. And in many cases, these new routes are more uh, dangerous, more complicated than the previous ones with an ensuing uh, escalation in the kind of game. The, there is a, a US scholar speaking about border games, very serious games, in the case of a frontera between Mexico and, and, and US, because you have uh, looking for new routes, professionalization of gangs, because they need to be professionalized to overcome the hurdles, uh, growth in, in risk and in deaths, and that's it. And it continues uh, that way. Uh, similar uh, trends have been witnessed already in Niger with the uh, reinforcement of controls along the Niger-Libya border, uh, the pressure on the Algerian route has grown, and, and similar uh, things can, can happen. I'm, I'm stopping here, and uh, I think I will leave the floor to Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Ferruccio, for a very interesting and up-to-date presentation. Um, what I will try to do is to talk a little bit more about how this is seen from the ground in uh, certain African countries where I tend to do part of my work. Uh, I'll also comment a little bit on the EU-Turkey agreement, uh, so I'll start with these two agreements and then I'll try to sort of tell you why I do not think this is very likely to work. Uh, and I call this presentation uh, Imagining Another Life Trajectory, Push and Pull Effects in the Pathway to, uh, Towards Europe, because I believe that um, what is happening is a combination of push and pull effects, which is not necessarily completely well understood within the frameworks of these two agreements. But if you start by looking at the first of them, which is the um, the agreement with, uh, bet with the Turkey, which as uh, Ferruccio already uh, underlined, uh, has a certain legal ambiguity to it. Uh, but the interesting thing with this is that it's part of a much larger sort of package in which uh, the EU and Europe is turning a much, much more attention to its borderlands. That is uh, obvious with regard to Turkey, but it's even more obvious with, with regard to um, North Africa and the Sahel. I mean, only five, six years ago, I mean, the, the issue of the Sahel uh, was uh, quite low on anybody's agenda. I know it sort of exploded to become one of the most crucial issues discussed, be it in London, be, be it in Brussels, and so on, and so, uh, so forth. But the question is, I mean, if the EU's new attention to its borderlands is this a uh, matter of trying to build genuine partnerships, or is it more about s simply the European Union and central politicians within Europe so, uh, suddenly went into panic mode in 2015, 2016? I believe that the deal with Turkey, uh, sort of made in March 2016, is best described as a deal made under considerable stress, almost bordering on panic. But the interesting thing about this, which touched into what uh, Ferrucci was saying, is that if you look at this, what actually happened on the ground, and I was uh, able to travel in parts of the Izmir region um, last autumn, 
and it was immensely interesting to see how effective the dismantling on the Turkish side had been of the infrastructure that had been established here to transport refugee migrants from the Izmir region to Greece, the nearby islands. Which at least suggests to me that this is a relatively strong, uh, strong state that has the capacity to control this. And that is exactly what they wanted to show. We have the power to control this. And the, the Turkish government's ability to control this, at least to dismantle this infrastructure and keep it on a very low level, has clearly given Merkel, Juncker, the EU a breather. But the sustainability of this agreement, if you can talk about this is a, as an agreement, is an open question. One thing is that the political relationship between the EU and Turkey is highly volatile. So it all, uh, even today in the, in the news, I mean, there is a new sort of row emerging now over um, uh, German access or politi German politicians' access to a base and so on. So I mean, this is a continuing moving train of volatility and it's very uncertain where this relationship is actually going to end. Whereas um, Turkey on the other side has proven its power as a swing door producer of refugees to Europe. What, uh, what Turkey effectively proved in two uh, in, uh, during, um, uh, during last year is that it can close the door and it can open the door and there is considerable bargaining power in all of this. And I have a feeling that uh, when I look at some of these conversations that is now going on within Europe, that European politicians, they forget very, very quickly. And giving them a breather, then they forget. But I'm uh, quite certain that the Erdogan uh, regime in Ankara is not going to let them forget the power that Turkey has over this. However, even if Turkey keeps the door relatively closed, the main problem with these kind of arrangements that is made under these kind of stress almost in a panic mode is that they do not address any of the root causes <coughs> behind this. So it may be giving Europe some sort of a breathing space, but it's not the end of this. <coughs> Secondly, if you turn to the EU's new attention to its borderland and then the EU-Africa Migration Partnership Framework, Clearly, this is a different kind of agreement than the one with Turkey. But the underlying issues are the same. Reducing number of migrants, refugees heading towards Europe. But it is also, this is also a very particular and quite peculiar arrangement as, as it's, it's sort of, in many ways, marketed as an Africa partnership. But as uh, Ferrucci was alluding to, I mean, this is basically, in its current form, has to do with main Sahel countries, and Sahel countries of a very, very different origin and capacity, uh, bordering from some relatively strong states like Mauritania, Senegal, Ethiopia, to Nigeria, which is somewhere in between, both a strong and a weak state at the same time, to then some of the most fragile countries in the world, like Mali and Niger. Very uncertain how this is going to work in these different countries. And uh, if you then add in that uh, one of the main sort of cornerstones of this agreement, also because uh, the Mauritania is emerging as a very uh, sort of privileged partner by the EU due to its uh, role in so-called G5 Sahel, is a country that is clearly on its very origin is on relatively shaky foundations due to the unsolved relationship between the Arab Berber tribes, which has always been in power in Mauritania, and the issue of both the Haradin, the uh, so, um, the so-called former slaves, and the Black Mauritanians. So I mean, uh, <laughs> Europe is betting a lot on something that is may look strong now, but is inherently quite volatile. But anyway, I mean, this is an attempt to make Afri these African countries to improve its border management state capacity, economic development, in exchange of aid. So this is clearly some type, some new type of con uh, conditionality, absolutely. 
But a much more important question is the degree to which this will work as the framework by basically suffers from the same problem as the arrangement with uh, Turkey. It does not really address root causes. Okay, this will also depend on how much uh, extra resources that this framework distribute and how it's used by African partners. But still, I mean, it's sort of extremely far-fetched to think that the extra euros that this will provide will play a big role in the case of solving underlying issues in places like Mali, Niger, or uh, in or around the Lakshad Basin in Nigeria and the borders to Chad, Cameroon, and so on. And part of the reason why we have this problematic is that, yes, people are leaving home. But people are leaving home for a number of uh, issues and reasons. Some live due to war. Some live, to, uh, live due to political uh, repression, natural disasters, climate change, increased, variab increased climatic variability. But a lot of people, particularly in, in the region that you mentioned, Ferruccio, which is one of the where you fin find some of the population most likely or with highest aspirations of, migra of migrating is people simply that people are leaving home because home is a bad place to be. They're not leaving uh, necessarily only due to war, only due to political uh, repression or these other factors, but simply because home is seen as a bad place to be. There's nothing new about this. What is new is the sheer number of people who are trying to leave. The highest since the Second World War and likely to increase because there are forecasts and projects here, um, projections with uh, regard to, for example, climate related uh, refugees that suggest that numbers can increase to between 150 to 170 million as we approach 2050, which to me suggests that we, have, um, we may only have seen the tip of the iceberg of the global refugee crisis, because there is a global refugee crisis. In Europe, I don't think there is a European refugee crisis. There's a European challenge with regard to handling this. But I mean, the refugee crisis is almost everywhere else than in Europe, in my point of view. <coughs> when it comes to this issue, this question of should I stay or should I go, what we need to sort of keep in mind is that the practice of dealing with refugees since the end of the World War II has basically been that the majority find sanctuary in a neighboring country region, while a few are offered refuge in the wealthy parts of the world. And this practice, which has never been codified really into international law or uh, regimes, but this practice worked quite well as long as the refugees after a while could ret return home. But that is not necessarily the case anymore in neighboring countries that are harboring a number of refugees. Because these are refugees that comes out of more or, more or less permanent crisis, which means that very few are able to return back home, whereas more and more, uh, whereas, uh, whereas there is an ever new arrival of new refugees. And this is, what, uh, this is what we are seeing now in the Great Lakes region, in the Sahel, North Africa, Middle East, border areas around Afghanistan, and the list could be uh, made further. Because the result of this is basically some sort of local overload. And if you get this kind of local overload, what you will see is increased tension between refugees and fragile poor host communities. <coughs> and this makes people uh, reflect on whether to stay or to make a desperate attempt at leaving for possible other greener pastures. And this is the issue that the international community, and particularly the rich part of the world, has neglected for way too long. We have simply taken the integrative capacity of poor host communities as a fact, as something that was given, something that would just continue. And now we are trying to make this continue even further through arrangements like the one the, with Turkey and also with the EU-Africa partnership framework. This is what this is all about, basically. If we then look at the push and pull effects, it's not, this is not only an either or qu question, but
but most often a combination. Yes, I mean refugees from wars and natural disasters are pushed away from their home of origin, but it is also often a combination. A combination of these kind of shock effects combined with the fact that for too many places, uh, people there come to realize two things. One is that I know something about how the world actually works for other people. We have to remember that Africa, but also Middle East and part of Central Asia, are some of the most youthful con um, continents that we have ever seen in history, basically. But not only are these places more youthful than they ever have been, but these younger generations are also better educated than they ever have been, meaning that people have aspirations, and particularly uh, young people have aspirations. They have aspirations for a better life. And if they uh, come to the conclusion that these aspirations of at least having a chance of social mobility, if they come to that conclusion, well, I mean, basically you give up on your own country. And in my point of view, this is what is happening in Mali right now. This is what is happening in Niger and many of these other countries, that the, the younger generations have basically given up on their own country. They don't see any future prospects there. They don't see any possibility <coughs> of at least having a slim chance of social m mobility. They know that they can stay and they can live. But then you also, uh, if that is your the way to conclude about your life, you also c have to conclude for yourself that more or less every day for the rest of my life is going to look the same as it looks today. Some people are willing to accept that, but not everybody. And some of those that are not willing to accept that, they will be so desperate to connect to another life trajectory that they are willing to risk everything, including their own life. And in my point of view, there is no way whatsoever that either this agreement with Turkey or the African Partnership framework in its current form addresses this. This is the core issue that one needs to think to. Because what is happening now is that we are having some sort of perverse creation of winners and losers along the different routes to Europe. And as uh, Ferruccio very correctly alluded to, these routes will change. They, they are changing all the time. New ones are established, old ones are not used anymore, and then they are started, and then something changed again, and the old <coughs> ones that was left uh, abandoned are suddenly used again. But what you're seeing here is sort of these uh, perverse effects of winners and losers. Winners in the form of, for example, traders in hub towns as uh, Agadai, Agades in Niger, in Sahel, to those along the Turkish coast, for, uh, for example, in Izmir, that until last year made a huge profit on this, selling larger quantities to higher prices or a new market for new commodities and services that previously did not exist. Two countries like Turkey has gained an enormous amount of new political capital, I would say, by proving itself as a swing door producer of refugees to Europe. To Libya, where carrying refugees across the ocean to Italy, or no, we do not, um, maybe not uh, no longer all the way to Italy, but uh, just as into coastal waters where they can be fetched by somebody else. But irrespective of below that, whether the, the goal is to transport them to Lampedusa or just to somewhere they can be, be picked up by an international uh, rescue operation. I mean, the, my point here uh, is that this has become a new growth industry in a country without a state. And this is, of course, the perfect kind of condition for running these kind of businesses. Losers, which are refugees and migrants, ever more stuck in a legal, social and economic limbo along these pathways to Europe, but also other forms of losers in the form of local populations that suddenly competes with a larger population for scarce, res scarce resources, be it land, water, employment, or suddenly sees an encroachment on, uh, on their traditional livelihoods. What this sums up to is that a, a combination of local overload and never-ending conflicts and this sends those with the possibility on a journey towards Europe. 
And it's not hard to understand, for example, the head of a Syrian uh, family who have been living in a refugee camp in Lebanon or, or Turkey for, t for the last three years, who has come to realize one thing, and that, is the, uh, that, and that is simply that this war is not going to end anytime soon. What should you do? Wait until all savings are gone? Or use what uh, he has left in a, in a desperate attempt to reach Europe, or at least send somebody of his family members to Europe? It's very easy to understand what uh, his decision will be. However, that emotional aspect apart, this does not remove the fact that this also means that de facto, through the way that Europe and other richer part of the world has handled this global refugee crisis, it also means that new hierarchies are in the process of being established. What this is producing is a new global production of winners and losers, where the relative winners are the few that can, can afford this, that can afford this journey to Europe. And they are just a tiny majority among the over 60 million refugees worldwide. For example, for those that have run away from Boko Haram in northern Nigeria to Niger, or those that have left the Central African Republic for Chad, these are, this is not an alternative. They are the forgotten refugees of this world. And they are not seen currently because they don't count neither in the agreement with Turkey nor in this uh, African partnership agreement. The refugees that counts in the European sort of accountants of refugees are those with a chance of reaching Europe. And this is what this is creating. Another consequence of this is that this leads to new and informal illicit markets for human trafficking. Of course, there are different types of networks, some more based on solidarity than others, but these types of uh, enterprises are increasingly being co-opted by criminal network, some local, some transna trans uh, transnationals, that earlier were involved in other types of criminal activities. But why traffic weapons or narcotics <coughs> when the profit margin is just as high for uh, refugees? and the likelihood of getting uh, punished right now, in fact, extremely small. <coughs> Routes and paths, uh, and paths change with circumstances, from Libya to Turkey and back again, or from Istanbul to Moscow to the northern, <laughs> northern Norwegian border, border post of Storskog, but the logic remains the same, and it should not be in anybody's interest that such networks grew even more powerful. But that they will continue to do if the root causes of this is not addressed in a more systematic manner. Right now, what we are dealing with is more cosmetics than trying to address the root causes. The good news is that, in my, in my point of view, we can still solve this, but only if Europe proves that it's fit for the future. And I'm not necessarily seeing a Europe right now that is really proving that it's fit for the future within this. Because this is a crisis that can be solved, but this can only happen through coordinated actions in Europe, but also globally. But Europe probably needs to take the lead in this also globally. Because what the world needs is a new global concert for tackling refugees, uh, refugee issues that also includes the plight of poor host communities in fragile states. Otherwise, this will simply not work. Yes. I'm not naive. We need better border controls, but we also need to let more refugees in, and we need to do more in poor host countries. Will this meet, uh, mean uh, new challenges? Yes, undoubtedly. For public finance, for security agencies charged with monitoring and surveillance of the refugees we do allow in. However, to me, there is not any alternative, because if we know Norway is part of Europe, if we prove unfit for the future, the only thing we will end up with is that ever more countries in Europe and elsewhere will attempt to close their borders to refugees, and there is no conflict prevention in this. This will only lead to more conflict, more radicalization, more violence, as ever-expanding groups of people are pushed from one border to another without getting legal access anywhere. And this is even more important because I am, this is one 
place where I, uh, if I'm looking 10 years ahead at a time, I would be very happy if, I'm, uh, if I was wrong, but I'm very afraid that I'm not. Because I think it's not very likely that we have seen the end of the global refugee crisis. It's much more likely that we are just to have that peak into the future. Thank you. for very interesting presentations. Um, now we will open the floor for questions, uh, for questions. but I would just uh, ask Ferruccia first if you, you want to start with a comment to, to, what, uh, to, to Morten's uh, presentation while uh, you sign up for, for questions. Yes, yes, with pleasure. Um, well, I, I fully subscribe to what Morten has, has described and I would, I would sum it up by saying that Yes, I didn't have time to talk more generally about the prospects, but I, I do agree that the, the challenge is huge and is a long-term one, that the European responses, and I would add the global responses so far even more, have been completely inadequate. Inadequate from at least three points of view, talking in particular about Europe. I mean, there is a first layer which is financially inadequate. The NPF, the New Partnership Framework, is, has as, a, as an operational financial tool a, a new trust fund for Africa, which is now 2.5 billion, yeah? which is for, for a huge region, which is probably the single most problematic region in the world with the, op with the important caveats about the internal differences that uh, Morton has made. I mean, Nigeria and Ethiopia are two big players in Africa. Mali and Niger are two of the most, uh, you know, fragile places in the world with the highest <coughs> demographic rates, growth rates in the world. And this is a factor which hasn't been mentioned so far, but it is probably the single most challenging factor, the huge gap between demographic growth trends and economic growth trends in that whole region. You know, and this applies both to Egypt, to Sudan, to Ethiopia, and to Nigeria. Uh, so financial inadequacy. Um, and to address this, the whole you know, concept of European Union's cooperation European governance should be turned up, upside down. The, uh, I don't know how to call it, the metaphor of the, of the Marshall Plan is often misused, you know, to, to apply to Africa these days. I mean, the last one, I think, was the German development uh, minister, uh, Gerd Müller, only a few months ago, and the Marshall Plan for Africa. Now, the Marshall Plan, the real one, as I think is mentioned in one of the two articles that were s handed out that I wrote on African European migration policies on Africa uh, and that you have uh, some distributed around. But the Marshall Plan was the equivalent of uh, 1,000 billion euros over five years, which is the total budget of the European Union mm. for a seven years period. So if you ever really thought of matching that, you should just, you know, getting rid of the budget of the European Union and re, you know, make it re from the scratch based on external priorities, which of course, nothing that is happening even by uh, plausibly in the next couple of decades. So financial inadequacy, institutional inadequacy, because in order to have a, a foreign development policy of that magnitude, you have to have a political will which is unified. You have to, to have institutional mechanisms to achieve a, 
uh, an integrated or at least consistent and long-term political will, of course. You cannot do it occasionally, like, you know, once. And so uh, this calls for, you know, a, an institutional rethinking of the, of the European Union. We have been talking mm -hmm. with Fanil about the chances of a real reactivation of German-French fr cooperation in the next uh, years in this new political landscape. And, of course, this is one of the key tests. Mm -hmm. Finally, conceptual inadequacy. Because at the bottom of this debate, there is a very blurred understanding of the relations between uh, migration and development. I'm not going, this would call for a couple of other <laughs> seminars, but the, the very concept of root causes that the Commission is basing all its strategy on is basically, uh, could be summed up by saying that if you address conflict and, and poverty, particularly poverty, with development, you, uh, you obtain less migration. Most of the economic uh, and social uh, knowledge produced over the last decades, not only in Europe, worldwide, shows that the opposite is happening, at least in the medium long term. And it's only in the very long term that developments stabilizes people. In the medium and long term, there is a cycle that enhances mobility. So addressing root causes is a just a, <coughs> again, it's a cosmetic rhetoric about the way in which politics and policies can address the complex relationship between uh, development and migration. I'm not dwelling upon this, but this is absolutely central, because you can have the money and the, insti and the institutions, the political will, but if you have it wrong from a conceptual point of view, you will, not, you will go nowhere. I mean, you will, you will have more migration, mm. probably, which is not necessarily a bad thing, of course, because even if you have you know, a m more development means normally there can be exceptions, and we can discuss about this. But, uh, more migration, but of a different kind. It will certainly not be the kind of desperate, uh, deadly, and improductive migration that we are seeing now at the southern border mm. of the EU. It will be a better migration, more productive migration, more humane, but also more productive migration for both who, migra both who migrate, both who stay back home, and the receiving communities. So this is not to falsify the idea that we have to invest more in development of sending countries, but to be aware of what this implies in terms of actual migration dynamics. Mm. Thank you. I think we we'll just uh, take three. Uh, they have three questions. We take them in a row, and then you can can get a chance to answer. So we have one here first. Yes, please uh, state your name and affiliation. Uh, my name is Ivan Hoffman. I'm a semi-retired official of the Norwegian Directorate of Immigration. I mean, worked on statistics and analysis, and um, I think Mr. Pastore uh, touched on a uh, question that I wanted to raise. Uh, you said at that the fourth pillar of the EU EU's migration strategy is new policy on legal migration. But you haven't said, n neither of you have said much about what that might be or, uh, in light of the demographic imbalances that are developing in Europe as well as in other parts of the world. Uh, would it be possible to say, is this pillar at the moment just rhetoric, or is there some reality to that such new migration policies might develop? Uh, we do know from experience that there is nothing as effective of getting migrants to move on or even back to their own countries that they have an ease of movement through legal migration. Yeah, I think we take one question over there. because it's a quite simple one on geography. But looking at the map, uh, if I were a North African migrant, I would easily conclude that the easiest way to come from Africa to Europe would be across the Strait of Gibraltar. But uh, increasingly, migrants are choosing another path, from Libya to Italy or from Turkey to Greece. 
So from the point of view of a migrant, what's the matter with Morocco and Spain compared to these other <coughs> countries? Okay, we take have a last question in the back. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Claudia Joachim. Um, I am here partly as a student and partly for basic income, uh, basic unconditional income Norway. I wanted to ask you some questions because I, uh, just one question actually. <laughs> I understood uh, that um, the EU and Turkey made a deal on um, unconditional payment for w about one million refugees. I think it was confirmed in January. Uh, as a um, card where they could use their card to pay for the necessities they wanted. I mean, one million refugees, I'm quite certain. I forgot, I didn't, I didn't get the name. You mean in Turkey? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was um, a EU-Turkey EU, uh, arrangement. I was wondering if you had any results on how this was moving on. Also, I wanted to ask you if a basic unconditional income for the refugees has been, I mean, as an aid uh, solution, has been uh, considered um, allocating the money from where they are today, giving to the people uh, fleeing. Also then because people then might go back to their countries uh, <coughs> when they then receive um, civil, I mean, their own, <laughs> their basic income uh, with their um, background as a, um, um, citizen of each country. Uh, that was, yeah, basically. Thank you. We have one more question. Can you manage one more? Uh, or do you want to start to? Oh, no. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Up front in the in uh, in the rescue operations, uh, just one comment to the numbers. Uh, last week, the total number of from Libya to Italy was seventy one thousand and twenty nine, and the number of dead or missing uh, was sixteen hundred and fifty. So that means the death rate is about two point three percent, or one in thirty nine, which didn't match the numbers you put up there. But those are our the numbers we uh, operate with. And then to the, the, the uh, which is uh, which is then a much higher death rate, as, as you pointed out, as as previous in years. 2017. In 2017. Yeah, this so is the number yes. so far uh, yeah. by by last week. These were the updated Thank numbers. Yeah. So so one in 39 uh, losing their lives on uh, from from from, oh, oh, from Libya. Uh, I'm um, I'm glad that uh, that uh, 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 Morten Herr touched on on uh, the um, financial side of the whole thing because uh, I think this is, um, ha has received very little focus in the whole debate, the, the whole industry behind uh, the whole migration thing. There is so much money involved. There are so many networks. There is so much money to be made uh, on both sides of the Mediterranean. If you look at the whole industry around uh, the reception of migrants in Italy as well, uh, this is... Uh, very, very lucrative business to a lot of actors. So if you look at who are, who are profiting on this and who are interested in keeping the migration up and increasing the migration, there are, uh, I think, a lot of actors that play a much more important role than, than uh, has, uh, has come up in media so far. Thank you. Okay, we still have actually one more, and I think since we're a bit over time, I think we take that one as well, if it's okay with that. Paul Messer from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Thank you for your uh, very interesting presentations. One question first for Ferruccio. We see now that there, uh, with a continued high number of arrivals in Italy, still with a change of composition of the nationalities arriving, there seems to be few policies, if any, on how to deal with these migrants after they have arrived. And uh, we've seen in Europe example of like-minded countries like the Visegrad group on the stricter side, but we seem to have very few initiatives on the positive side, including dealing with the groups arriving in Italy, moving on to Germany, France, Switzerland, etc. Are there any such initiatives that you know from the Italian side? 
Another question from Martin Buos. Uh, you had in prospect number of 150 to 170 million climate change displaced. Now yeah, that's the total. Uh, I mean, uh, this is um, this is a figure that has been. I mean, <coughs> the background of that figure is basically that. Uh, I mean, it's a projection that has been made where you sort of take the the current number, and then you look at uh, a, a global temperature uh, um, increase of two to four degrees. And uh, then you have made a, and then people have made a projection based on this. I mean, of course, it's uh, all kind, all possible kinds of these projections are uh, extremely uncertain, uh, but uh, they do sort of put an uh, gives give you a glimpse into what this kind of future could look like. Uh, basically, I mean, if we accept that uh, there is a c relatively high likelihood of that kind of temperature uh, rise as we move towards 250, and then you look at where is this going to hit the hardest, where it's going to hit the hardest in the, in the weakest countries in the world. So it's based on that kind of reasoning that this uh, projection has been made. It should, uh, I, I did not mean it as sort of a very precise projection, it's more a way of thinking about what, what the future may look like. And again, it's sort of all of this in combination suggests to me that Anybody who thinks that we, uh, we have seen the peak of this and, and that this is basically over and now we can breathe uh, peacefully, Europe managed this in a, in a way. Well, I think uh, I think um, uh, the future will prove that kind of reasoning wrong. Yeah, sorry for just <laughs> jumping in there. Do you want to answer to some of the other questions as well, and then the chicken take the floor after you? Yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, uh, I mean, uh, this more which has to do with uh, the developments on the uh, more on the European plane. I I'll leave to you, but uh, just a couple of uh, reflections. Uh, I mean, uh, on this, uh, I mean, uh, as you raised, I mean, I, I do believe that we need more serious studies into the larger political economy of the whole. Um, I mean, there is both a separate and a very sort of. Uh, there is a separate refugee economy, both locally but also globally. But uh, there is also a, 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 an economy that is mainstreamed into other economies, and we need to understand this this better. We have sort of seen so a few glimpses uh, about this, about uh, concerning um, estimates about how much money is generated via the, how to say the ordinary smuggling networks. But then uh, what I think you meant was also that there, is a there are other huge industries that are uh, much more formally that is uh, being established around this. Wasn't that what you was pointing at? Yeah. yeah. And obviously, I mean, like there has been the case of Norway, I mean, somebody has made an uh, awful lot of money on this. And when, when people are making an awful lot of money on, on something, I mean, do they have any then interest in seeing that this um, uh, that this is an activity that is reduced? Well, at least that question can be um, be raised. So, but also, I mean, in the case of some of these countries where the uh, where uh, the EU now is trying to initiate its partnership, I mean, we know that there is a huge collusion between some of these people who are on the government side now talking to the EU about how to prevent migration, how to stabilize border, how to protect border, how to manage border, are some of the very people who are in collusion with a number of traffickers. I mean, this is something we know from Mali, from Niger, from Nigeria, and other of these Sahelian countries. So, I mean, clearly, I mean, here you have people who are, in a way, they are paid both ways. I mean, they are paid by the, uh, by the Europe to, pre to, uh, to prevent uh, an uh, outbound uh, migration that they are partly also responsible for. They are responsible for it due to the mismanagement of in domestic uh, <coughs> resources, but they are also directly responsible for it because they are in, in uh, colluded operations with, with traffickers. And that is also part of the dilemma. I do agree uh, with you, Ferruc, about uh, this, about uh, root causes are extremely difficult to address. But on the other hand, uh, if you're not going to uh, allow this simply to continue, and I mean, uh, it's not only a matter of continuing, but I'm afraid that what is going to happen in the Sahel if these projections of, um, of a global rise in temperature are, are correct, because I mean, 
uh, a rise in global temperature of four degrees would be um, costly for uh, or even for Norway. It would, uh, would lead to increased costs, but I mean, it could make life in parts of the Sahel completely unlivable. And if life becomes unlivable, we may see a much larger crash there uh, than what we are currently are um, seeing. So I don't think we really have any choice but try to act. When it comes to this issue of sort of what is the cutoff between, I mean, let's say that you get, you are able to assist a country like Mali in achieving <coughs> something that at least looks like peace. You are able to sort of help transform the Malian economy so that it works in a slightly less ex exclusionary <coughs> way than it uh, basically has worked ever since this country was established as an independent state. Then the question is, when is the cutoff rate there? When, when does this start dropping? And I, don't, I don't think that this is just a matter of, uh, of a growing economy. It's more sort of a matter of a growing belief in the country. And that is, uh, that is when this, uh, this is going to drop. This will clearly take some time because, I mean, <coughs> as long as people think that, okay, this may not last very long, okay, the, what's best to, to do? Uh, still continue to try to get out or stay and place my bets here. But it's v I this is basically sort of um, an extremely unsecure science about where that cutoff rate will, uh, will be. I'll stop there. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the excellent question. All point out two very, you know, central issues. Uh, starting with the question on Mr. Hoffman on, on, on legal migration, right? Yeah. Uh, is it just rhetoric? Now, uh, so far, yes. Uh, from a historical perspective, Europe has seen in the 15 years before the financial crisis outburst in 2007, a major intake of labor migration concentrated, it seems paradoxical now, in Southern Europe and the UK, <coughs> two places where you wouldn't head now. Uh, that was uh, mainly based on a geopolitical restructuring of mobility, which was, I, I put it simply and, and a bit roughly, but opening to the east and closing to the south. So the vast majority of these flows came from within Europe, you know, well internal transfers from Central and Eastern Europe to Southern and Western Europe. And in both same years, there was a relative closure to Africa. So Africa was already a secluded continent from, an in from a global mobility point of view. And this characteristic reinforced itself. So Africa is now, today, even though we have been speaking all the time about that, but is the continent which exports less people, both in absolute and relative terms. Mm? And so it's a secluded continent for, you know, we could talk about that for, for ages because it has to do with, with history, with ideologies, with, with perceptions, and with actual dynamics on the ground today. Uh, whereas Europe is the single continent which has a bleaker demographic outlook in the long term, and even in the medium term for some countries, including Germany, Italy, and others. So a simple equation would go, you know, let's exploit the complementarity. It doesn't apply. It doesn't work like that. Uh, first, in order to rebalance from a purely demographic point of view, the, the, the aging and the in, pro in prospect population decrease in Europe would require huge numbers. Those huge numbers wouldn't be enough in any case by themselves to stabilize demographically Africa. And what is more, there is a complete mismatch from a structural point of view in terms of economic skills needed, which could be addressed, but in the long run, in the medium to long term. And uh, there are major strategic uncertainties about the nature of labor markets in Europe and in the developed world and globally in 10 years time. So we don't really know what will happen to low skilled jobs, which were the main driver beyond, uh, behind uh, this major labor migration intake in Europe and particularly in Southern Europe in the early 2000s, late 90s. So this makes 
for a, a very you know, deep uncertainty in European countries, in European capitals, and in Brussels about the real potential for legal migration. And frankly, I wouldn't bet on that. I mean, keeping open channels is important for many reasons, primarily for symbolical reasons, not to give an African youth the very deep feeling, which is completely crushing and overwhelming today, that he or she has no chance to get out. So this is very important, mm. but it is not the decisive uh, game changer. Uh, Gibraltar and Morocco. Uh, <coughs> who was that? Mm, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, 20 years ago, Turkey and Morocco were the two, 30 years ago, the two main senders, the two big, you know, non European, at the time Turkey was still perceived as largely non European, certainly Anatolia, where the migrants came from, uh, sending countries. They have now entered a migration transition. They are quite advanced in that migration transition. The threshold which makes migration convenient and attractive for a young Moroccan or a young Turk has moved up quite a lot. So the risks and the costs they, a young Moroccan is willing to take to migrate are higher than before. So the patera, the, the small uh, junky boat that used to be the you know, symbol of irregular migration to Europe 10 e 15 years ago is not a viable option anymore for the vast majority of Moroccans. So the pressure from Moroccan migration from Morocco is reduced for those reasons, which doesn't mean that it is not anymore there, but Morocco is certainly one of the most reliable and trustworthy partners in terms of joint cooperative migration law enforcement for the European Union. So we can trust them to make their job in terms of exit controls quite reliably and, if needed, ruthlessly. You know, 2005, the launch of a global approach was originated by shootings, probably by Moroccan forces. It was never definitively proved on the fences of Ceuta and Melilla. So this can happen. But uh, as for the control on transit migration of sub-Saharan migrants from Morocco to, to the EU, that also is, is taken care relatively well, I mean, in, in practical law enforcement terms. And also from a fundamental rights point of view, Morocco has gone a long way. Morocco in the last five years has operated two large scale, relatively large scale, regularization schemes for sub-Saharans living in Morocco, which is the first step towards acknowledging the reality and granting fundamental rights. This is something which would have been unimaginable in Morocco 15 years ago and is unimaginable in, for instance, Al Algeria or Egypt today. So this is, I think, part of the response. Uh, the scheme for giving cash to refugees in, in Turkey. This is probably the most Im interesting uh, component of the cooperation uh, program with Turkey. It's based on mainly, I don't know it in details, but on vouchers given directly to Syrian families. And it's managed, I think, by IFAD, by the International Food and Agriculture uh, Organization of the uh, UN. What was behind is the idea that it was, well, the risk is, was and is that this money, the six billions or whatever, would go to reinforce uh, an authoritarian you know, uh, shift in, in Turkish politics, would go to uh, Erdogan and, and, the, uh, and his party and, and the whole huge machine of uh, clientelism and, and consensus building that is behind it. So giving money directly to families, to, Sir, to migrant fam to refugee families, is a way to circumvent this. And this is why that experiment is particularly important. I know too little about the actual 
implementation, and I think that measuring the implementation of that particular scheme as of similar schemes in other countries would be even more difficult, I would say impossible in a place like Egypt or Ethiopia. So Turkey is already quite, you know, a, a more structured and advanced and paradoxically transparent environment for cooperation than other of a priority countries here. Uh, the question by well, Jack of MSF, thank you for updating the figures, which become even more frightening. You know? uh, industry of reception. I mean, there are many industries of reception on, on all sides. Mm -hmm. The first side is on the side of sending and, and transit country particularly, and, and Morton has said how in many cases, there is a risk that some of our partners profit twice from getting the money from the EU and from the smugglers, or being directly colluded with the smugglers. This is happening in many areas. We, you know, there are people who are selling oil both along the legal channels and along the illegal channels. There are people in many countries who are controlling both the legal and the illegal trade channels for diamonds, for instance. Mm. So this is an old story. I, I don't think we have to be surprised. We should be scandalized. We should be ashamed, probably, also, but not surprised. So if this happens with migrants, after it has been happening for decades with all other commodities, because migrants have turned into a negative commodity these days, uh, we shouldn't be surprised. We just should you know, face it and, and tackle it. But you were hinting also at the reception industry, mm? at the industry of you know, exploiting the money for welcoming, for reception, etc. This certainly exists, and it's partly perfectly legal. I mean, if there is in uh, eastern Turkey, Gaziantep, mm, there are cities which have doubled in size. Mm. And of course, people are benefiting from the boost to demand of a number of items, from housing to, you know, to cheap work. And this is economics. I mean, it has to be probably monitored, controlled. Maybe there are excesses that have to be repressed, I mean, excesses in exploitation, for instance, because they create competition with local for labor force. But this is physiological, I would say, to some extent, and maybe also positive. You know, certainly, I was at the border between uh, Libya and I was in, uh, in Agadez, for yeah. instance, and there, certainly, the Tuareg uh, were very happy that there was an opportunity of revenue, which was partly, to some extent, in some periods, uh, diverting them from the option of guerrilla or of smuggling of other goods. Mm? But then border controls were reinforced, were introduced, and then you have to turn to back to other uh, profitable activities, which can also be you know, starting some, some form of conflict in order to regain political standing in the Nigerian state. So these things can happen. There is a political economy. As for the industry of reception, for instance, in Italy, hmm, because this connects me to the question of, of, a, of a gentleman about what is being done in terms of policy responses in Italy and in other receiving countries. Now, not to speak only about Italy. Germany has set aside from here, from last year to 2020, 20 billion euros for the reception and integration efforts. Italy this year, in this year's budget, they have set aside 4.6 billion for ser from search and rescue to integration. These are huge numbers hmm, that certainly we didn't see on integration policies 10 years ago. I mean, at the time, integration policies were counted in the order of the millions, hmm, not of the billions. So this is a cost for receiving countries. Then, of course, part of this money goes to local 
employers to local mm, uh, managers of reception uh, centers to local uh, agencies in charge of active labor em employment policies. And some of it is absolutely needed and absolutely commendable and useful. Some of it is degenerating, of course. When there is a m money, in my country at least, I don't know yours, <laughs> there is okay. also temptation. <laughs> and <laughs> and so this happens, certainly. There, are, there has been inquiries. There have been investigations. I certainly cannot claim that, but the mayor of the city I'm spending part of my life, Rome, had to resign partly on a scandal associated with mismanagement of reception funds. So I, I would kindly invite you to re refrain from too simplistic representations. Hmm? Uh, so the policy is there. I mean, the, of course, Italy, like many, uh, most countries in Europe, certainly in the whole of southern, central, eastern Europe, uh, had an underdeveloped reception system, which proved and revealed itself dramatically underdeveloped in the wake of the 2011 peak and afterwards. There have been efforts to boost it, to reinforce it, to, to, to expand it, which are insufficient. Currently, in Italy, there are 180,000 persons in reception, which are awaiting decisions on, on their uh, adjudication of the asylum process. Uh, the vast majority are in not in the ordinary reception system, which should be decentralized, the small reception centers, etc., but in what is called an emergency reception system managed directly by prefectures uh, based on insufficient monitoring of the conditions. In principles, in principle, if you engage in reception, you have to grant a number of services, you know, linguistic, uh, psychological, legal, etc. It's very hard to monitor in, on a systematic basis, and this applies also to Germany. I mean, the, the impressive effort made by German lender and, and authorities is l one of the most commendable policies in Europe over the last decades, I think. But certainly, it, it has flows. I mean. Uh, Ninety percent of Syrian refugees in Germany are unemployed after one year, and it, it lasts. It's very hard. It's a very hard task. But uh, yes, it has to be. Uh, it is complex. I mean, it cannot be judged uh, uh, on a black and, and white. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think, think that's I think that's we all. have to Thank end. Yeah. We have we have the room until twelve. I'm sorry that we went a little bit over time, but it's a very interesting topic, so I think it was worth it. Thank you very much for your interventions and thank you for your questions. I would just say that we have another seminar in, in the NUPI seminar series on European issues. Uh, the Greek European minister will come here the 14th of June, and he will probably also uh, touch on these issues. So I welcome you back on that for that. Well, thank, you. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.